This used to be a jack pine and popple forest. It received a clear-cut harvest two years ago. What you see now is the natural regeneration of the timber. If you were to take and try and plant jack pine mixed in among the popple like it was before, it would be an unending chore. But leaving it as natural regeneration, it will produce a better harvest next time, a higher yield, and a nicer stand of trees along the way. This tree's been dead for several years, and yet even the small branches here, they're still sound. They're solid, they're not rotten away, and yet the trunk of this tree is so rotten, I can dig the wood out with my fingers. The difference between the little branches and the trunk of the tree, that's what I want to talk to you about. The branches, even though they're smaller, are still solid. The wood inside is good, and yet the trunk of the tree is rotten. It's because of rot that it's leaving, but why did the trunk of the tree rot before the branches? It's because of something that is called surface to mass ratio. The trunk of the tree has a lower surface area to the mass ratio. Anytime you, if you take a, a circular object and double its diameter, the mass or the in, inside area will increase four times. Now these branches got wet same as the trunk of the tree got wet. But the branches, in that they had a higher surface to mass ratio, they were able to dry out where the trunk of the tree absorbed the moisture and had a lower surface to mass ratio, and they didn't dry out. So rot is the result of that. Now, any wood uh, untreated is going to rot or start to decay once the uh, moisture content passes, say, 30 percent. That's the basic figure. Once it gets has a higher than a 30 percent moisture content, the bacteria, the fungus, the, all those little organisms can thrive. So anytime you're working with the, the round wood, uh, building out of tree trunks, keep the house dry. If you don't, you might have this. And you wouldn't want your house looking like that. So when you build out a round wood, out of tree trunks, keep it dry. There. I said all of that to say this. The secrets of the woods are constant. And if you work with those truths, then everything will flow like a river. To go against the grain is like planting your garden in harvest time. This is all part of working with the wood. In building log furniture and log handrail, we want to keep as much of the natural character as possible and still cause it to be what we see in the tree. The first thing that we will do is to look at the obstacles that must be overcome. Material. What is your building material? Bark. Somehow, you have to get this stuff off. Sap. Sticking to your chores is one thing, but this can be a mess. Then there's mold, black blotches with fur. Moisture, if a piece of jack pine weighs 20 pounds fresh cut, it should weigh less than 10 pounds before you build with it. Blueprint, 
How do you design, measure, cut, machine, and drill a workpiece whose surface is constantly inconsistent? Cutting match tenons. We will explore several methods of tenon cutting and tenonizers, tenon cutters. Glue joints. No bolts or screws. Assembly. This does not have to be the place referred to by the term sweat equity. Now do it all at a profit. Here in Minnesota, my favorite furniture wood is jack pine. What we are doing here is a thinning cut. We take the split top, scarred, and injured trees. We also cut the understory pine. Stunted pine that will have a poor chance of survival. When we work a cut this way, the overall stand of timber is benefited by the removal of the low-grade trees. But this is also to our benefit. This type of tree has the most character, allowing us some artistic measure when building our furniture. And most landowners are more than willing to part with them when we treat their land with respect and pay them a just price for the wood. For ease of handling, the material is cut to only two sizes. For material with a top size of four to six inches, the workpiece is cut to a length of 50 inches. The smaller wood is cut to a length of 100 inches. These sizes are comfortable to work with and may either be carried to your transportation or as we prefer, skidded out of the woods. For bark removal, you do have a few choices. Harvesting standing dead trees, where the bark has already fallen off, although some climates will not allow this, as standing dead timber sometimes rots before the bark falls off. Then of course there's the draw knife. It helps if the workpiece is held firmly a simple clamp works well. If the bark is knifed off in the winter months, say from January through early March, then there is generally very little sap problem. But on the other hand, if it is cut off any other time, you will have to deal with this sap. It's kind of like a good breakfast. It sticks with you. The third bark removal system is one used by wooden rail furniture and tenonizer technology. We call it the natural satin system. High pressure water and a Rotex nozzle. High pressure water with an ordinary nozzle alone will shred the wood surface. But use a nozzle like this and the bark can be removed with no damage to the wood at all. This nozzle puts out one pinpoint stream of water. This stream of water is spinning in a circle at several thousand RPM. Recommended pressure and flow is 3,000 to 3,500 pounds and four gallons of water per minute. This method of bark removal will work on almost any fresh cut conifer type tree, except northern white cedar. White cedar should be left in bulk piles outside for one year. After that time, the bark will almost fall off leaving the wood undamaged underneath. The remaining cambium can be removed with high pressure water and Rotex nozzle if the wood has been kept moist for a day or two prior to the pressure washing. But with some, like our jack pine here, we end up back at our sap problem. So we come to the second half of our natural satin system. Heat during drying, and tenonizers sanding station. We will look at that later, but for now, handle the wood as little as possible so that the sap does not get smeared around. 
Immediately after spraying, the material is placed in drying position where a high volume of air can flow over the wood surface. If the high flow air is missing, it is possible for the wood to be covered with black mold spots in only 24 hours. Moisture content, air dried, kiln dried, all things that cannot be seen with the eye, but make a major difference. For in the drying process, there are major shape changes that take place. To create a high grade piece of furniture, the material to be used must be dry beyond the point of future movement. With our climate here in Minnesota, it takes three to 12 months to air dry a four inch diameter pole to a moisture content of 18%. An ideal to build with is 10 to 12% moisture content. In drying wood, there are only four things that make a difference, safety, airflow, temperature, and humidity. This was our first kiln. It is four foot by four foot by 16 feet long. It has a one half horsepower fan at one end and two 1500 watt heaters at the other end. The wood is piled in the center. This pole weighs 20 pounds. The pole weighed 40 pounds. The moisture content is about 15%, safe for building with. We air dry our material for a month or two before it goes into the kiln. Once inside the kiln, it takes two to three weeks to bring it to a 15% moisture content. If the outside temperature is 60 degrees, then the temperature inside the box will be about 110 degrees. There are air ports that let the humid air leave. Never place the kiln near something that would be damaged if the kiln caught fire. This is our outline of things that we will cover. Bark, sap, mold, moisture, blueprint. Well, here we are. We can step into the classroom and go to work. The concepts we're going to talk about first are what it takes to actually, to actually design and build a piece of furniture. On this bar stool, or this part of a bar stool, we've got leg and what we call an X rung, or the center rungs, instead of having four rungs that go around the outside, we have just one set that goes through the center. Now, we're working with something that, um, because it's log work, it's constantly changing. We've got, on the small parts, it's not too difficult, but when you get to things that are longer, the surface of the material is constantly changing. It's changing in diameter, it's changing where it isn't straight, and as far as measuring something, there's nothing that's consistent on this material, except one item. You've got an imaginary center line that runs through the center of the material. Even though the material shape, okay, you can see it's all changing, we have right through the center, our imaginary center line. Now that's the only thing that we know on here is a constant other than we can measure the length, but measuring something else like the placement of this hole or the angle that the hole gets drilled at, that's something that from measuring from the outside, there is no consistent way to do it. So we're going to go through the design the, the dimensioning or the line, what we call line drawing, and then actually building something using this center line design concept. All right, this bar stool or the leg of this bar stool, if we go down the line, the center line of the leg and directly across from corner to corner. The angle that this leg is at is 10 degrees. Where the rung, the X rung comes in here,
This is also, this angle here is also 10 degrees. So we have a 10 degree angle at the top where it's drilled into the top. Follow the center line of the material, it's the imaginary center line, and across this imaginary center line, 10 degrees, 10 degrees. It's a very easy um, way to build. Now, if we change and go to our other style of bar stool that actually has four rungs in it, this little one here, we come in with a different sort of problem. The legs are still set at 10 degrees. But when we come down to the rungs, the angle changes. When we ran it from corner to corner through the center, same as the top, 10 degrees and 10 degrees. But now this rung changes. And there is a formula that we can use to calculate the exact angle that this rung is at. Now, for the people that have a carpenter background, um, you'll be familiar with in house building on the roof structures, you would use on a common rafter, you would use as a base number, you would use 12. But when you get to a hip rafter, you would use a common, or the base number would be 17. Now, the relationship between a, a hip rafter and a common rafter is the same type of relationship between the leg and the rung. We can use the same formula that they use on a roof structure. Now, in, for a carpenter, they would be familiar with that as a, the law of 1217. For us, we're, since we use inches and the dimensioning that way, made it usable for the furniture working people, and it's the law of 1.41. Now, if we take the angle here, which is 10 on this leg, going from corner to corner, set at a 10 degree angle, and if we take 10 and divide it by 1.41, we get the angle of this rung, which is 7 degrees. Actually, it's a fraction over 7, but we'll call it 7 degrees. So if we were to work with this, we've got 10 degrees, 7 degrees. If we were to change this leg angle and swing it out to 12 degrees, we would have to go and, you know, we'll even push our calculator here, go 12 divided by 1.41, and we get the angle of this rung would then be 8.5 degrees. Now, it's a, it's a consistent formula. It will work all of the time as long as you're working with a 90 degree angle uh, that the rungs would set, be set 90 degrees to the leg. All right, we're gonna take a closer look at how this center line design actually works. Here we're looking right at the line drawing using center line design concept. You can see each one of, each one of the four legs the rungs, you need to visualize as you're getting to each piece of furniture, this, the center line, because you're gonna be pulling all of the dimensioning, all of the angles, all of the dimensioning off of this imaginary center line. All right, working from our, our center line design here, our line drawing of our center line design concept. As you go from uh, building one piece of furniture to another, in order to get the proportionings right, a lot of times it works well to make a, a full-size mock-up before you start cutting the wood parts and, and actually see if the, the angles that you've got in there, uh, the height and the sizes, if dimensioning to see if it's correct. Now, in order to take and, and figure the, um, the car, say, the cardboard cutouts that you're going to make the mock-up out of, in order to figure that, or to make, a, to make it full size, we want to put in another, another thought of the how-to. 
um, using a little protractor, you know, a little a little protractor that you've got. Here you've got the you've got the radius and the little degree indicators on the protractor. You generally they're very small. In order to get it from this small size and to enlarge it to use for like a you know making a chair. Chairs are kind of complicated um, to get their proportionings correct to make out of log work. But in order to bring that up to full size, if you can take and we'll say what we faced. What we did was uh, we looked at and said, well, figuring degrees, it would be really easy on these big patterns if one degree equaled an inch. So he said, well, if we took a, a circle, 360 inches around, each degree or each inch of that circle all the way around would equal one inch. Well, we found out that a, a circle 360, to 360 inches around is, uh, what does it come out to? Um, the radius is 57 inches, so it's a little bit large to work with. So, okay, we'll take it and make it, we'll make the circle a little bit smaller and we'll come down to a circle whose circumference equaled out so that each half of an inch equal to one degree. So we've got a circle with a total diameter of 57 and a quarter inches. So if we take from the center of our circle and come out 28, uh, 28 and 5 eighths inches, from the center and go out 28 and 5 eighths inches, if you were to come up 5 inches, that would equal, in our little pattern here, would equal a total of 10 degrees. If we came up five inches, we would have a 10 degree pattern. Now that's something that sizable is easy to work with and, and we can make our um, mock-up of our piece of furniture, make it out of cardboard, see that the dimensioning is correct. Um, it's a, a lot less time consuming to make a cardboard pattern, a lot less expensive to make one out of cardboard than it is to cut up all of the log material, all of our parts and pieces, and and uh, build one, and then find out that the the dimensioning is incorrect. So we use that radius, 28 and 5 eighths. Every half of an inch equals one degree. All right, we've seen how to calculate the angles, the differences between the different styles of, of leg and, and the different angles working with. But now how do you actually take and drill the part where actually drilling the hole accurate? Now we're going to look at some things on a piece of machinery that's um, maybe a little bit more elaborate than what you would need. But the concept that we're going to look at, the concept that we're going to use, is usable on, on any drill press. You don't have to have a fancy anything to make this work in your own shop. If you're working with, um, say, just 90 degree angles, like you would find on a, on a piece of handrail or a bed frame, using just 90 degree angles, it's a real easy concept to be exactly exactly accurate for the for the hole placement for drilling and that's what we're going to go to next this is dr press it's a tilting column drill press but now the things that we're going to describe as far as how to um, you can set up a regular drill press, just a regular drill press for drilling, um, well, anything to do with, uh, say, the 90 degree angles, a regular drill press is going to work fine. All that you would want to add to it is a table, like this one here. This is made out of a 2x12 with a 2x4 on the back. 
Now, what makes this special, or what makes this work for our center line design concept and our line drawings, is the way that this table is arranged here. Now, we've got we've got our center line of travel of the drill, and from the back, from this two by four up to our center line of travel, as far as our vertical travel, the distance is four inches. And we have our little blocks here that we set our parts in. From the bottom of the block up to the center of the block is four inches. From the edge to the center is four. And again, from this edge to the center is four inches. So when we take our part, in this case, it's a handrail post, which is basically the same as a bed frame post. We put it in our block. The tenon has been the tenon's been cut oh, to match this this hole size. This is a one and five eighths hole, one and five eighths tenon. The center of the tenon is the center or our imaginary center line. That is the locating point of our imaginary center line. We put the block on, and now our part is held so that from the tabletop to our imaginary center line in the material, the height is four inches. From the back of, from the fence up to our drill bit line of travel, we have four inches. So we, we have consistently located our imaginary center line in the material and it is consistent with our drill line of travel. Now we can use this uh, regardless of the material shape, regardless of the contours, if it's got crooks and hooks in it, if it's, it, material shape doesn't make any difference. We're gonna take and we'll, using our center line design, we'll take and drill a hole halfway through from one side, the other half of the way through from the other side, and the holes should meet exactly perfect right in the center. First thing we'll do is we'll fasten our log in place. And we'll put our, let's see, we'll have to come up on the side. We'll put our hole at go 10 inches down. We'll go 10 inches from the center line to the end of the material. Even if we could drill all the way through, we wouldn't want to do that because the pressure of the bit as it would run to the other side, it would just blow a big chunk of wood out of there. So if we take our workpiece, we'll end for end it, and we'll come down to our 10 inch mark here using our little ruler behind here. you can see, our hole is an exact match from one side to the other. You can do the same thing on a, just a regular conventional drill press, but it's the way that you set up the table that'll work. And using this technology, these techniques, um, bed frame kind of uh, work, handrail work, um, it becomes really easy. It takes all the guesswork out. We're going to go from here to cutting, <coughs> cutting tenons. Now we'll go through a couple different ways of tenon cutting. Um, we've got, 
you know, at Wooden Rail Furniture and Tenonizer, we've got our own equipment that we use. Of course, we manufacture and sell it. But there's things that you can do as far as tenon cutting that are they, they don't have to be uh, expensive. I know there's a lot of people that are looking at making just uh, a piece of furniture here and there, a bed frame, uh, something for their own personal use, and they don't want to put a lot of dollars into it. Well, they don't have to. We're going to go through some things to show you how to do it fast, easy, safe. We'll get it done nicely. We're going to go over an uh, inexpensive but very accurate way, fairly accurate way of cutting tenons. Uh, we're going to use a hole saw. To start by putting, choosing the middle, where the middle of the tenon is going to be. Now this is a one and a half inch diameter hole saw. So the tenon that we make, since we're going to be using the inside of the hole saw as a tenon size, the tenon diameter is going to be about an inch and a quarter, inch and five sixteenths, somewhere's right in there. So we cut the little jacket. And we just cut down to our little center piece, or our cut that we made with the hole saw. Bring those knife cuts just a little bit onto the tenon there so it looks nice and clean. There. Now we've got a consistent diameter. And we can cut the same, we'll cut the same tenon on the other end and it ends up being a real inexpensive way of cutting the tenons. All right, we're going to cut the second tenon. We want to keep the, the drill line of travel as straight in line with the opposite end as possible. All right. helps a lot if you can secure the part solid so it doesn't rattle around or move or crawl on you when you're cutting the tenon. And of course the sharper your knife is the better it works.
The second method of tenon cutting is demonstrated here in this bed frame. The tenons have been cut with a tenon chuck. This cutter works something like a giant pencil sharpener. It is most important that the workpiece is held securely during tenon cutting. A different cutter is required for each size tenon to be cut at a cost of a few hundred. To guarantee that one tenon is directly in line with the other tenon, the guide hole for the axis shaft is cut on this boring machine. The hole being drilled is just like it goes right straight through the workpiece. A drilling jig or a boring machine like this one is included with each of Tenonizer's tenon cutting pads. For our classroom project here, we're going to make a piece of, well, in this case, it's a uh, queen size headboard, which is the basics for the handrail or bed frame. I mean, it's all the same concepts where you've got top and bottom rail, spindles, and end posts. So we're gonna, what we cover for bed frame will work for handrail. And here is our paint by numbers kit that we're going to make our uh, that we're going to make our bed out of. We've got wood that's sappy and sap stained and it's just kind of a jumble of parts right now. We're going to use uh, tenonizers, tenon cutters for doing the um, the tenon cutting on the different on the different parts. It'll get us the, the highest degree of accuracy. We can work with, on the spindles and the tenons, they'll be cut to an accuracy of plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. So using this, we can, we can just glue all of the parts together. We won't have to use any nails or screws or anything like that. They'll just get glued together. So uh, we'll go from here to actually 
cutting the tenons and drilling the holes and putting it together. And our end result of this pile of parts is going to be a headboard for a bed frame that's just as nice as this one. We're going to, we're going to cut a two-step tenon, similar, well, the same style as what we have on our, our uh, bar stool leg here, where we have a square shoulder tenon followed by a radius shoulder tenon. Now the surface here, this uh, square shoulder, will give us a positive stop in our workpiece when we go to press it together. And the combination of this will make an extremely strong glue joint, so where that's all that we'll need to, uh, to hold the workpiece together or hold our bed frame together. But we'll cut this square shoulder tenon first, and then we'll follow it up with uh, the radius shoulder tenon. Now we've already got the machine set to cut a one and a half inch diameter tenon, or one and a half inch diameter square shoulder tenon, and we'll start it up. We're going to pull a length here, and we're going to come down to from our stop on the one end, our square shoulder tenon, to the where we want the square shoulder tenon to stop on this end. Now we remember we're using that square shoulder tenon as a positive stop. So when we press the bed together, we'll just press it in till this square shoulder tenon that we're going to cut till it bottoms out in the hole that we drill. That way every bed frame is, uh, is exactly the same, all the parts are interchangeable, and we, uh, it works out well that way. So we've got our mark there. And we'll just come down to the point where we split where we split the line in half. Now we're ready to cut the radius shoulder tenon. It will follow down 
from our square shoulder tenon, and this part part will be ready for ready for the uh, holes to be drilled into it. This is one of our bed frame posts. Now, when we prepare this, we'll do it exactly the same as we would a handrail post or a bed frame, same thing. We're going to cut a square shoulder tenon on the end. That will give us a, a perfectly flat shoulder to work, for, work from. And since the way that the tenon cutter works, the tenon cut on one end is directly in line with the tenon cut on the other end. The shoulder of the tenon is cut in a manner so that it is exactly 90 degrees to the tenon shaft. So we'll use the tenon that we cut to hold the workpiece when we drill the holes into it. After we're done drilling the holes, we're going to take and we'll cut that tenon off and that will allow, or the shoulder that's cut, will allow the post to sit perfectly flat to the floor. Or if we were making a handrail post, the post would then sit perfectly flat to the fastening assembly to mount the post to the floor. And we would have a um, exactly plumb or a uh, exactly level post. So we'll cut the tenon. just cut down to our line. And we'll cut the second post, and away we go. We have reset the, the tenon cutter to cut a radius shoulder tenon. We're going to cut that to a 2 and 9 16 diameter. And one of the things that is really nice about this equipment here is that when we get to knots and stuff like this, they really don't uh, bother. Now, if we were cutting this down with a draw knife, we would have to either fight with it or 
um, cut the tenon in another place or find a different workpiece. But with this, the knots really don't bother. And if you ever try and take a trucking machine to something like this, clamp the part down good. Otherwise, you might find it across the room. You slide the workpiece all the way on, then start bringing it down to the cutter. Until the little depth stop hits that sets our diameter at the two and nine sixteenths, then just slowly draw it back and finish the tenon cut. We have reset the tenon cutter to cut our spindles for our headboard, and we're going to turn the part now using this little flexible drive shaft. This works really nicely on parts that are up to about 15 pounds or so, until they get a little awkward. But for this, they work out really good. We've set it up to cut a one and a half inch diameter tenon, and since we're going to be gluing it together, we set it for exactly an inch and a half and we'll press it into the hole and just glue will hold it together. The tenon will be two and a quarter inches long. find that on some types of wood you'll pick up a little squeak like that. A little WD-40 in the hole and, and uh, that'll, that would take care of it. Exactly one and a half inches in diameter. You can see the little mark right down there. And we'll just go through and cut each one of the tenons just like that. All right, boys. See, we've got, I'll do a right side up for you, four inches to the center, eight inches to the side, four inches up from the bottom. 
Now the tenons that we cut, one and a half inches in diameter, we'll cut a one and a half inch diameter hole here that will match up with the tenon that we cut. And for what I'm doing here, we'll cut, we'll uh, make up four of these and fasten them to the two posts and drill the holes. Now the drill bit that we're using here for this, it is a, it's a Milwaukee self-feed bit, but we've taken the little point and these little self-feed points, they come out, you just loosen a little set screw on the side here, and these points come out. Now we've replaced it with just a, a point instead of the self-feed thread. If we use the uh, the self-feed thread, it would overfeed, and then of course we can't back it out because it's got the threads on there. So we grind the threads off and put it back. But you'll see these bits later on. We're, we're going to show you another place where we use them, where on the job, if we've got to install hand railing or something like that on the job, this little self-feed point, this replaceable point, becomes invaluable to us. And as, as far as I know, Milwaukee is the only one that has them. But Regardless, they work very well for us. Three quarters, seven eighths, seven eighths short of the middle. We're going to set our depth for our hole depth. It'll come down to a point of, for this seven eighths of an inch short of the center of the log. Now we've got we've got four inches from the tabletop up to the middle and we'll come down seven eighths of an inch short of the center. post in to using our tape on the back of the fence here to 10 inches 10 inches up from the bottom and we're in our center line and our line of travel and everything is squared off here just leave this piece in its blocks and we'll set the other one up and drill that. Or at 40 inches. two holes in each post, they're exactly 30 inches from center of the one hole, from the center of the one hole to the center of the other, we're exactly 30 inches. And we'll just change the bits and pick it up there again. Okay, we've reset the depth. So as the drill bit comes down, it will stop at three inches short of the table or one inch past center and that will match up with that two-step 
tenon that we cut. Now once we turn the bit on, we'll be able to watch the little point and then just guide it into that hole that's already there, a little point hole, and they'll blend together real nice. see how that two step hole works and should be able to set it down and that tenon should pop right in there. There. Well, we've taken our headboard rail and this one we're going to use on the top probably we'll see how it how it looks when we're done but what I want to talk to you about for a moment is the the rail itself now any curve say if we're working handrail ideally you put the curve either to the right or to the left not not up or down you put the curve right or left and then that will make everything uh, work easier as you go along. So since this one is almost perfect, or it's got little kinks in it, but uh, we'll set it on the table, get a good look at it, and I'm going to put the curve towards towards you there. Now what we've done so that during the drilling that we don't make any errors during the drilling since we want our layout to work out perfect. So we've taken a piece of duct tape and put it on top of the table and gone and figured out the place where our blocks will be, our little block here that's on the end. This surface here will match up with the pencil lines that we have on our duct tape it goes down our table. And we put it on the duct tape so that once we're done, we'll just pull the tape off and we'll be ready for next time. Well, now we gotta pin this other end in place also since this is the one that we're going to be doing our, working our layout from. So we make sure that's on there tight all the way on. Then for our, our depth of drilling, our, um, our spindles that would be going in here are uh, 30 and a half inches long. And we'll drill the holes, as the drill bit runs down, we'll drill the hole so the hole goes down a half of an inch past center. And that will allow us, so we have a little bit of room to play with so we don't get any, anything uh, impinging when we press the thing together. Now on the rails that we've got, since they're almost perfectly straight, as far as, you know, as far as log work goes, uh, since they're almost perfect, we can, we can let our blocks run up against the fence and follow the fence right down the line. And all of our spindles are going to be directly in line. Now, if we had rail work, as we often do, that's uh, 
got an amount of bow to it, or in a, you know, a couple inches or inch and a half. And that happens a lot. Uh, what we do then is, with the bow turned either to the consistently, so that the top rail bows the same way that the bottom rail bows, we'll turn that, we'll turn the rail so it bows to the side, and as we drill the holes in it. We would set our blocks up on edge like this so we could adjust in and out, and we would follow the center of the material and drill the holes in the center of the material versus the imaginary center line. So that's, that's about the only time that we would ever deviate from that imaginary center line, is when we have a, a handrail that has a, a bow in it, then we would follow the middle of the material instead of the middle of the rail, or the middle of the imaginary center line. You can see this one here is getting just a little bit close to the side. In fact, this next one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull it out just a little bit. And nobody's ever going to see that once it's assembled. It'll keep us from having a problem here. that are longer, it's a good to have on hand a little block of wood to slide underneath here. So as the pressure comes down here, I'm right on a knot, so it's, it's wanting to bow a little bit. But if you have a block of wood to keep that from, from bending, just wedge that little block of wood under there so you get the full depth of, uh, of drill travel. That's the end of our first rail. And we'll cut the second one just the same. Cut the holes in it just the same. And we're going to look at furniture builder enemy number one. And that is, we have sap on here, surface sap that's just eased its way out of the wood. And we have some mold. Now this material was debarked using the high pressure water and it was put in a spot where it didn't get enough airflow and it didn't dry down fast enough and the result was uh, that's where the mold came from. The sap, that comes just on a normal, that's just what the wood does. Now there's two ways we can get rid of the sap. One way is we can take the material right after it's pressure washed and put it in a dunk tank, a little tank that's kind of like a kid's wading pool or something like that. And the material can be held underwater for a week to 10 days. During that time frame, the sap that you see here will come to the surface, and it comes to the surface, and then it just, it just kind of stops moving. But it takes about a week for the process to go through. Now, if we take it out of the water and spray it with the pressure washer again, that will remove the sap, and we won't have any more problem with it. Now, we can go at it another way also. We can use this sander here. This has a uh, plastic bristle on this sander here. You can see it's just, they're just kind of soft, but they're plastic bristles, not steel. They have an abrasive, uh, an abrasive coating on them. And we'll sand this piece of wood on this sander. And the only place that we, well, the bulk of the material is sanded with this side, on the bristle side. And on the other side of the sander, we have this air inflated drum. You can see it's, it's cushy, it's soft, and you set air pressure in it. It's a six inch diameter drum, and it's nine inches long. On this, the only thing that we sand are just the knots. 
So we'll, we'll hit the knots here, and then we'll sand the bulk of the material on this other one. Now this is a spindle for the bed frame that we're going to be putting together later. Right now I'm just going to do one half of the workpiece so that you can see the contrasting from the way it looks now to what we're going to do to it. see how the contours, you know, the little bristle, it can get into the spots around the knots and get in there and clean it up. We've taken all the sharpness off of the knot here, see how nice and smooth that is? And yet the natural mm, contours of the wood, the, the, the smoothness of the surface, all the natural contours are there. We haven't damaged the wood at all, and yet the sap's gone all of the, uh, the majority of the sap stain is gone. Now ideally, we would have dried this piece of wood so it wouldn't have the, the mold and things on it, but it does happen once in a while. We don't want the wood to be trashed just because it has mold on it, so cleaning it up like this works very nicely. Now it's a lot faster than if you were to just use sandpaper, hit it with the sandpaper, and while it'll, for a while, work, the sandpaper just gets loaded with the sap and you have to keep changing paper all the time and it just, uh, it's very costly. But uh, these little bristle, these little bristle wheels like this, uh, these are actually, um, the wheels ind individually are available through Grizzly Imports. Um, we set it up as a is a uh, wide wheel like this where we're seven inches wide on this drum but the individual wheels one inch wide they are available through Grizzly Imports. A little bit of Elmer's glue
Nothing like a beautiful day out at the lake, huh? And since this is our, this is going to be the, the bottom of our rail, of our headboard, we'll put all the spindles in so that the branches point up. I might even turn these things so that they show they're nice. Be nice if somebody was there to hand me some spindles. that crack so nobody can see that one. This one will get him hidden a little bit too. Nice. We have, generally what we'll do as far as the, the, the large end of the material versus the small end, since we have the taper in the length of the tree, is we're, we'll alternate. So like this is the, the large end of the top and we'll put that matched up with the, the small end of the bottom rail. Here, it's going. I have my little sometimes when we assemble assemble them, we'll use a little carpet pad and a block of wood. Of course, the carpet will absorb the, the pounding. get to assembling it would be really helpful for you around home or whatever uh, get another set of hands to help and uh, don't ask your wife unless you get along real well because it can be kind of a trying spot sometimes you're kind of trying to stay ahead of the glue and Get everything to fit right. Oh, there we got one that's perfect. There we are. As long as this other one stayed like it was supposed to, we can drop it into the into our posts. I've been accused of using a little excessive glue sometimes, but uh, as long as I stay ahead of the drips, I've never regretted it. Of course, you don't want to get any glue on the outside of the holes there.
and we have our headboard. We're going to look at how to finish off our headboard to fit a either to fit an existing metal frame or to add on your own frame. Now, as you can see on this, this one that's already done, we have a flat spot here. This flat spot is just over, just over 10 inches high. It's going to give enough space to mount for the, for the metal frame. What we do, as you can see, we've got our headboard set up. Well, actually, the entire headboard is set up so it's level. And then we come and we start flattening this spot off. Now, we've tried it with machinery, bigger stuff, and I always come back to my little sander. So what, what I do is working with this just a little level, as long as this whole headboard is set up so it's level, I just work with the little torpedo level, and I'll just flatten off a little spot. Well, if I was working on this one, I'd just work through and flatten off a spot and keep sanding down. It'd take maybe, maybe five minutes or so, start with I would measure from this little hole up and say so I'd come up about an inch and a half or two inches up just so it was the same on both sides of the headboard and cut a flat spot down just like you see here. Now when I got it so it was almost perfect so it's basically perfectly flat along here but I've still got circle marks I would come with a belt sander and just cut it just enough with the belt sander just to get rid of the little swirl marks from the disc sander. Now after we've got that, we can use either a little angle iron bracket that would fit to the side. And what we usually do is we'll take another piece of angle iron and we'll weld our rail that would go from the headboard to the footboard and we'd weld that on there and then just with a couple of leg bolts we just take and stick a leg bolt down into the leg and mount it solid. Now if you want the log character to remain on the side of the rail and you've got the angle iron in there like that, one helpful way to do it that's fairly easy is to take one of the logs and just split it in half and then fasten fasten it to the side of the angle iron on the bed frame. Now if you haven't got access to welders and things like that, or somebody that could put it together for you, another way that works really nice, still using angle iron bracket, is to use just the, just the angle iron bracket where you bolt into the headboard still, but then for the side, take a piece of 2 by 10 Now, you'd have to adjust your center so it would work out correctly, but you'd fasten the 2 by 10 or 2 by 8 to the angle iron. You'd just bolt through, and there again, bolt to the headboard, and you'd have a nice wood side to your bed frame. And we've got one here with an oil finish on it. Now, this has one coat of Watco Danish oil finish, medium walnut. That's what this has. And it's one of my favorites. And the thing about the oil, if, say, over a period of time, you know, it gets kind of uh, beat around a bit and the kids are kind of rough on it or something, you can come back later, like we did on this one here. Now, this is the same, same type of wood we have. On this one, we have a white pine top and jack pine legs. On the bar stool, we have a white pine top and jack pine legs. Only difference is between the finish on this one and the finish on this one is that on our little stool, when it was about a year or so old, we went over it a second time with Watco Danish Oil Finish Medium Walnut. Now, this one is a little bit different as far as how we put it together. The the legs have just one tenon cut on them, and as you can see on the top here, we ran the tenon right through the top, made a saw cut in the top of the tenon, and drove a little wedge in there. It's kind of a 
cute little way to finish it off. Our second bar stool that we have here has just a lacquer finish on it. Now it looks really nice now and it can stay looking really nice if you're not real rough to it. Well, here we are at the helpful hints part of our program here. And we're going to play a, a, for instance, for example. Let's say, for example, that you've just finished this nice little section of handrail. And you're ready to install it in the house. And you get to the house, and the contractor meets you at the door. And he's kind of got a grin on his face. And he says, well, we've changed some things. Uh, we don't need this little post anymore, even though it looks nice. Uh, we put a, uh, a bigger post in its place, and you're going to have to match up to it. And you look at your rail, and you think, well, let's see. I've got a handrail that has, from center to center, is 27 inches. It's exactly 38 degrees on our little angle here. We've got 38 degrees. And the contractor thinks he's got you. You've got to fit it to a permanently mounted post. So what are you going to do? Well, you can just look at them and kind of grin and say, well, not a problem. So we're going to look at how you can do that. First thing, we've got to get rid of this post here. We'll just kind of set him to the side. We've gotten rid of our post and just kind of set it to the side since we don't need it anymore. And we're going to take a look now at how we're going to fit this to a permanently mounted post. Say, for example, the contractor really put a tree in the middle of the house, which sometimes they do. So, this is what we're going to use. We have a little guide here is what it ends up being. We have two little quarter inch, actually they're uh, nuts, quarter inch nuts that have had the center drilled out of them, and they're welded to this little steel plate. Now, this, this plate is a piece of uh, four inch flat stock. It's a quarter inch thick. And we've welded these little nuts to it after we've cut the plate at our 38 degrees. Now, our handrail from center to center was 27 inches. So we've got these little pieces welded on here from center of so the top one to the center of the bottom one is 27 inches. And they're set at that same 38 degrees. Our plate, we fastened to the tree with a couple little sheetrock screws. Actually, there's a total of four sheetrock screws. And this plate has been leveled. We've got our little level here. Where it's level, or a plumb, we should say. Plumb run in both directions. So it's exactly straight up and down. Our next step is we take this long quarter inch drill bit and I favor the ones that just have the uh, the uh, little flutes right at the bottom section. We're going to take our little drill bit here, our quarter inch bit, go up, go up to the top one We're just going to drill a quarter inch diameter hole into the tree. Now this is a small enough, light enough bit. We just kind of work it back and forth and get this little guide hole just perfect. Now the tenons that we have cut on our handrail, they're just, uh, just straight tenon. Uh, they're two and an eighth inch diameter. Actually, they're about a 64th undersize. Let's say two and a half inches in diameter, and the straight portion is approximately four inches long. There's no need on handrails to use that uh, that same style tenon or that two-step tenon that we used on the um, 
on the bed frame. We just use that where we need a positive stop. But on handrail, this other style pendant, it looks just wonderful. Okay, we've got both of them to the full depth now, and we can, we can remove our little guide from the tree here. give you a better look at this template here. Since these little nuts are a half of an inch in diameter, we cut our plate so it was from end, I say from point, from the corner to the point is 27 and a half inches long, made up for the thickness of these little nuts that we welded on here. We don't need him anymore, not for this one. Now, we'll finish drilling our holes out. Green wood can get a little bit sticky. Now this is the concept that we're using here, can be used in a lot of different areas. But here on the, on the tree, running it like we are at such an angle. It's kind of stretching things to the limit, but it still works really well. Now, a lot of times on a post, when you're drilling it in an angle, if we started with our, with our chipper bit, this is a Milwaukee bit again, if we started with our self-feed bit where we've taken the self-feed point out, if we started with this bit, we'd probably chip the post. So. We've taken, now this is a two, eight, two and an eighth inch bit. We're gonna start the hole with this hole saw just to get enough cut around to get below the surface so we don't chip out the post. Now this hole saw is just a regular hole saw, but instead of putting the, let's see, instead of putting the drill bit in, we use this quarter inch bolt stock. It's just a regular hole saw, but we've slipped a six inch grade eight bolt in instead of the drill bit. Now, on our Milwaukee bit, this again two and an eighth inch, they have a little set screw here. And we've taken the self feed point out and we put another piece of this uh, quarter inch diameter grade eight bolt stock. We cut the head off and slip that in in place of the little point that was in there before.
we're just going to follow, we're just going to follow that little guide hole we put, and just going to follow it down. the second one here. Two holes, two and eighth inches in diameter, exactly plumb, and at our 38 degrees. There. Now you can grin back at that contractor. Now you can use the same concept in several different directions. We've got another little gadget here. If I can see where we left them. Just a single set of the little guides. And they are set straight up and down, or plumb, to the flat bottom surface of our little piece of angle iron and you can set it on the floor or on a flat surface if you have already if you just need to go straight down and then use the little guides that way or we've got this uh, little bullseye level mounted to the top you can just put it on there with silicon or or uh, double stick tape where you can get the thing set so you're exactly level put a guide hole in or like we did here with our twin set exactly 38 degrees and 27 inches center to center in a permanently mounted post. Well here we are with our handrail post. It's been sanded but as you can see there's an extra little piece in here. We're going to uh, show you how if this was a piece of handrail post instead of our bed frame, how we would fasten this to the floor. What we would do first, we've got, we've taken on our, where our square shoulder tenon was, and we cut the tenon off, and then we just sanded off the little uh, nubbin on the bottom so it's nice and flat. Now, the way that the square shoulder tenon cutter works is that during its cutting, this surface that is cut here actually has just a real slight concave um, 
to it. It's just a little slight dish to it. So if we take this plate, and we have a, let me get it apart here, a wooden plate for the way we would set this up if it was on a hardwood floor or something like that. This is a fur plate. Now the plate will go up on top of on the post. And this steel plate that goes on is a quarter inch thick, six inches square, and we've got it arranged for eight holes through the center, and this hole in the middle is our locating, this hole in the center is our locating hole. Now that's going to match up with the hole that's in the end of our workpiece here, in our post. So we'll drop that on there, just like that. And we take a half inch bolt, line it up, get it in there, feed it into the hole in the post so that everything is directly in line. We're still working, still working with our imaginary center line or that, that uh, line right through the middle of the material. So right now we have the exact center of our post. We'll put this back up on our table. And for, for instruction purposes here, we're going to say that our table is absolutely level. It's level, flat level. That's what we're going to call it. Then we're going to take this little level here. Now we've got our plate right here. It's setting flat to the table, so it's all it's square to the world. And we'll, using our little level, we'll bring our a little, a little insert here. Now this has been, uh, this has been flattened so that the flat that's been cut on here is exactly flat to the tendon that was cut. So we put it in the hole. We get it so it's level. Now we'll shoot the screws in through the bottom of our post. We've got, uh, we've got these Torx head screws. We've got eight of these that we're going to run in through the bottom of the post. And that'll securely fasten the post to our plate. And these, let me get this off of here again. With our steel plate, we've got three, or three eighths, excuse me, four three eighths diameter holes that have been drilled in here. And we'll take a, a leg bolts and run these down through these holes. And that'll fasten post to the floor. Once it's fastened to the floor, we can take a little wooden button and pop it in each one of the holes and all of the uh, mounting hardware is going to be hidden. Now like I say, this one would be for a floor, like a hardwood floor or something like that. And if I can get my drill here. going to first drill a little pilot hole. We'll drill one little pilot hole so that uh, we don't split out our plate. This is perfectly level. Let's see. And we would go around and drill a little hole through up through each one of the little holes in the, the wooden plate so we don't split that. Put our bolts in all the way, our, our uh, Torx head screws in all the way around. And this pretty well becomes an immovable object. We have our pin here, and we'll take our post 
and you can see how nice this fits down around the bottom here. So we can just put our four bolts in there, fasten it down, put the little buttons over each bolt hole, and it's finished. Now, this works great if you've got a tile floor, a hardwood floor, if it's going on, you know, finished stair treads or something. But when you have a carpet floor, we have this other plate that's arranged, same on top, as far as the buttons and things. But if you see here, uh, we've got a, a quarter inch dado cut or a rabbit cut that goes around the outside here. And we'll put our steel plate on the bottom. Now this other one, the steel plate was mortised, mortised into the bottom, it was cut out with a router. But with this one, the steel plate will go on the bottom of this, which will give us, give us a half inch space around the outside. Now with that, once we fasten the plate down, it will give us a half inch space under the plate so that you can tuck the carpet around the edge of it. On our different styles of tenons that we've been using, we have a radius shoulder tenon, two and a eighth inches in diameter, this one is about three and a half, three and three quarter inches long. Now we would use this for the stairway. This is a leftover stairway part. You can see the, where the spindles were drilled into it. That's why the, the tenon is so long. Normally on a regular handrail rail, we would cut the tenon two and eighth inches in diameter or two and nine sixteenths. Depends on the size or the diameter of the material. This one, but normally we would go to uh, two and an eighth with a tenon length of two and a half inches. The other one that we used on our bed frame with this two-step, we got the positive stop and the excellent glue joint from this two-step tenon, the square shoulder here and the radius shoulder tenon here. But the only place we use this two-step tenon is on, on uh, chair legs, bar stool legs, um, our bed frames, it's just an extremely good joint, and it's really easy to cut for us. The third piece that we have here, this is a, the top portion from our log, uh, it's our full-length dressing mirror. You can see the dado cut cut in here. And then the, just the standard radius shoulder tenon. This is a piece that'll show up in one of the uh, videos that we've got coming up where we take projects start to finish such as the uh, full length dressing mirror and we'll run that one through. But we've got other things in store so we'll be back. I just wasted it. Oh, golly. wonder if anybody's going to notice that I'm sitting here in the middle of poison ivy. <laughs> and we could use a little bit more electricity out here. Mm -hmm. 